Berlin is a city of transition. People come and people go. A city where many misfits, artists and writers have sought solace, inspiration, escape, have tried to find themselves in a city that is said to be condemned to eternally becoming. A city with a history it cannot hide and doesn't try to. A first visit to Berlin can be like finally meeting a relative you've heard stories about all your life, a relative with something of a reputation. Despite warnings, you are drawn to her complexities and contradictions, her insouciant self-confidence, masking insecurity, and the fact that she so clearly wears her past on her sleeve. Rule one. Find a place you trust and try trusting it for a while. Guten Tag, having a wunderbar time here in Berlin where the streets are wide. It's so quiet and there's so much space. Life seems to run at a much slower pace. I say run, the only time I have seen anyone run is for a train or going for a jog. There are more dogs than cats. Everyone has a bicycle, and even though there is hardly any traffic, they still ride on the pavement. And you can get vegetarian hot dogs. Mm. I am taking a million photographs every day. I'm finding it hard to sleep. There are windows all down one side of the studio so it's very light and overlooks some apartments with their lawns and trees. And of course, the obligatory bit of Berlin graffiti. It's so liberating being here. <coughs> There's so much space, space to think. Ideas are pouring all over the place, and ties between things unravelling. I'm trying to keep calm and keep playing. Ponder is my middle name. She remained puzzled, unsure which way to turn, her head permanently bowed in a position akin to that of a classical statue. Incline to deviate from the horizontal or vertical slant, to be disposed to a certain preference or opinion or course of action, to lower or bend the head or body in a nod or a bow. My poor feet have been doing a hell of a lot of walking, but it's good for me and the best way to see things. I've just walked back along the Unter den Linden in the drizzle. suddenly found herself alone. The temperature control in the galleries had dropped, giving a coolness that reminded her of being in a church or a cave. 
the silence and simple beauty of the objects in the room she now entered gave her a sense of almost overwhelming calm. Her steps slowed and she trod softly, stopping in front of a cabinet of Japanese porcelain. She gazed in awe. If only those lips could talk. She had an enigmatic beauty that held beneath it some veiled truth. What she was hiding from us, we would probably never know. Perhaps she carried with her a deep secret or something had happened that she could never forget. Yet there was this lingering sense underneath it all that she did not want to trust again, to love again. As we were talking, I could sense that she wasn't really listening. There was something else on her mind. It was as if she was someplace else entirely. The historic Bauhaus was a creative laboratory of ideas which sought new impulses and solutions for a modern age. Gropius's founding concept of the Bauhaus was of a community of artists based on friendship, seeking new life. Myself, my sister and my good friend Nils set off early on Sunday morning to Hauptbahnhof, the big central station of Berlin with its I can see forever long platforms and all sorts of trains going to enticing locations. Whilst waiting on track three, a long blue train slowly pulled in on the opposite track. That's the train to Vienna, my friend sighed. A red double-decker train arrived shortly, taking us only half the way to Dessau. Our friendly ticket man appeared. His name tag translated as Mr. Beard, so apt as he was indeed living up to his name with a full face beard. He was sporting the regulation, and rather fetching, I thought, pinstripe waistcoat, the proper attire for a gentleman working for the train system. He kindly informed us of our changeover, and within the hour, we walked across to a platform in the middle of nowhere with a view of nothing and ate the picnic I had brought with us to keep us going. 30 minutes later, a train came in. We crossed over the rails and got on. My excitement started to mount as we reached our destination. All was still and oh so very quiet in Dessau. We followed the signs to the Bauhaus. Only a short walk from the station, so flat, so clean, so empty, like a ghost town. And then, there she is, the sunlight bouncing off the white walls of the Bauhaus. This luminous building, a curious yet striking feature in the urban landscape, still seems modern in its cool elegance and formal simplicity. It was early morning. The sun had not been up for long, but its rays were straining through the clouds bouncing off the whitewashed walls of the house opposite and pressing up against the glass of the windows of the study, forming shadows across the floor. The writer sat at his desk, sitting in the perfect chair at the perfect desk with the perfect lamp. He let out a deep breath and pulled himself closer to the desk. He picked up the perfect pen, took another breath and held the pen to the paper in front of him poised to write the first perfect sentence of the perfect page. Nothing happened. He laid the pen down again and sat back in the chair. He looked round the room, taking the perfect colour scheme he had chosen, finally resting on the view from the window for a moment. He closed his eyes slowly, feeling the sun on his face. Although he was now used to the slight ringing of tinnitus in his ears, he could hear the faint strains of a melody 
coming from somewhere else in the house, probably from the radio. His nostrils started to flare slightly, detecting a familiar and pleasing aroma. He had almost forgotten about the perfect cup of coffee sitting at the corner of the desk. And beside it, the perfect biscuit, a Leibniz. Only the Germans would name a biscuit after a philosopher, a philosopher most noted for his optimism. It was Saturday and the sun was out. I decided to take the S-Bahn over to Tiergarten. The Troddle Mart spreads along the Strasse from the station. After being told off by a very angry stallholder who nearly knocked my camera right out of my hands, I came across an object of beauty. During my wanderings last weekend, I discovered this place. I could tell there was some sort of building in the near distance and walked towards it. Eventually, I came out of the woods to a kind of square. I could see a door open on the front of the building. As I got closer, I could hear the sound of an organ playing. Very slowly, I went through the doors and stood quietly for a long time. She lies down in profile, her pretty eyes closed, with heavily mascarad lashes, curling themselves like fine caterpillars. Arched above them, her finely drawn eyebrows stand up in defiance and go on forever. The bow of her lips sits perfectly, and her hair curls its way back as if windswept from her dreams. Her head rests on the pillow positioned just so. A silken butterfly appears, as if it's about to fly across her face. She shuts her eyes in anticipation, the butterfly's wings just skimming her cheek and brushing her eyelids. A fluttering of wings and lashes. <clears throat> she figured if she hung around long enough and often enough, Someone would eventually spot her with her chiselled looks and porcelain skin. Soon she would be whisked off to Paris for Chanel, maybe even America. There are variations on the story of Nico's association with department store Cadavai. Apparently, at the age of 16, she was working in the laundry department and met photographer Herbert, Herbert Tobias whilst they were both working at a Cadavai fashion show in Berlin and it was he who christened her Nico. She stepped onto the escalator with trepidation, imagining the treasures that the floors above would hold, of his taking her into the realms where everything becomes a luxury, so many choices of something else entirely. She mooched around, circling the many perfume and beauty counters, eventually coming to a halt at a small wooden counter that stood out from the others, which were all perspex glare and staffed by women with profoundly lipstick mouths. First, she recognised the English bottle of Penthaligans, but the collection of more unusual looking glass at the end of the display counter caught her attention and she began gingerly picking up the bottles one at a time. As she leant across, 
she spotted the fine craftsmanship of Lalique glassware, beautiful. The design of the bottle so captivating, she completely forgot to sample the perfume inside. Then she reached out for a much smaller, squarer, less interesting bottle, bearing a blue ribbon with the word chocolat woven into it. It smelled divine and she sprayed it on her wrist, but not at all like chocolate. She used to wear a vanilla <laughs> perfume herself that made her smell like a cake shop, but it didn't cost 85 euros. With this thought, she decided to venture back to the food hall and find the glorious patisserie. But in the whirl of it all, she suddenly felt quite claustrophobic and couldn't find a way out. She searched desperately for the escalator to take her back down to earth. The closer he got, he couldn't help noticing that she had that habit some young women have of continually, but unknowingly, playing with a lock of hair or an earring, biting their lips or nails. A kind of nervous tick, I suppose, expressing some anxiety building inside. Once he had noticed, he couldn't stop looking to see what would happen next. But suddenly he realised he must have been staring for some time and nervously turned away. Since I got back from my brief return to London, I have been rather ill. Yesterday, I escaped to the park in the late afternoon. I couldn't stand it any longer. The sun had been blazing all day, and I was missing out. And besides, the band rehearsing downstairs were making an awful noise. So I lay in the Wittenstein Volkspark, along with most of the rest of Prenzlauerberg, put my earphones on and did Gregory's Girl Dancing, trying not to fall off the edge of the world, listening to Susie and the Banshees. The last couple of days, I have been mostly wandering around German housing estates in search of the city of tomorrow. He wasn't coming. She had anticipated this, but on approaching the theatre, some of her anxieties had begun to diminish. And once she had entered through the magic doors, she felt she had left her former self behind. The low light and soft colours of the decor had put their arms around her, and she felt a welcome warmth come over her. Time seemed to have slowed down. She tossed her hair gently as the pace of her steps slowed, her shoes falling softly into the carpet. The beautiful turquoise of the bar upstairs beckoned her in. The young waiter acknowledged her presence, came forward and drew up a chair for her. She nodded her appreciation and a slightly flirtatious smile 
turned up the corners of her mouth. She ordered the house special drink, a kind of wine punch of set with pineapple, mandarin and melon. She decided there was no point in checking her watch, but the clock above would not be ignored and kept her informed of the minutes ticking by. She could see herself reflected over and over again in the mirrored room. She had made some considerable effort this evening. She had tried to match her lipstick with her shoes and brushed her hair a hundred times until it gleamed. The silk blouse she had decided to wear was virtually new, only worn once. It complemented her eyes and to her delight went well with the immediate surroundings. The bell rang to indicate that the performance was about to begin. His ticket lay uncollected at the box office. It would almost have been a full house tonight. She let out a small sigh and picked up her drink. There was just one piece of mandarin floating in a few bubbles at the bottom of the glass. What would they have talked about anyhow? In all honesty, he wasn't particularly good company. He never had much to say and most of the time failed to show that much interest in anything she had to say either. He wasn't all that to look at, and she had noticed he didn't even bother to match his socks. She would probably enjoy the play more without him. It wasn't as though she were entirely on her own. He was a whole room full of people. She pulled back her chair, paid for her drink, and followed the last of the crowd into the auditorium, the heart of the theatre. Once again, it was as if time stood still. The usherette motioned for her to take her seat, and as the magic doors closed behind her, she entered another world. There are more bars in Berlin than you can shake a stick at, but there is none like the Leidecker. A family business since 1877, it has been handed down through the generations. They brew their own fruit liquors, and the place hasn't changed much, except for maybe the odd record cover or Elvis mirror on the wall. The infamous and very strict Lucy Leidecker used to sit in her high silver chair at the end of the bar, surveying the punters well into her old age. But it's not so busy these days. We sat in the bar, almost alone, drinking beer and fruit liquor and feverishly munching on flips, each of us with a plan, a dream of doing something other than what we were doing presently. Nicky talked extensively of his plans to return to the countryside and make schnapps. Lisa had spent almost 15 years trying to fill a theatre every night. Hans was tired of shop work and knowing every detail of Scandinavian design. He should really go back to his photography and would make a great tour guide. Matthias had been spending a lot of time outside of his job helping a friend with a fitness video, but was thinking maybe it was time he took a course in film. Otto dreamt of opening a flower shop, a flower shop that would only sell one type of flower at a time. He would buy a big bunch wrapped in simple paper with no fuss and when all the flowers had gone for the day, he would simply shut up shop. And then there's me. And while that's complicated, maybe I should just stay here in Berlin and open a bar.
Within a few days of touching down in Berlin, I was introduced in the best possible way to Schoenberg by being invited for dinner at my friend's apartment, which, by the way, is fantastic. On subsequent explorations, Schoenberg strongly became my favorite area of Berlin. Being in the western side of the city, much more of the area survived the devastation caused during the Second World War. Its historical presence and off-kilter appeal can be seen and felt in its old world splendor meets post-war symmetry. It feels, certainly in comparison to the area of Mitte Prenzlauerberg, where I was staying, as a much more lived-in part of the city, where there is more of a genuine mix of real people. It has also been the centre of gay life in Berlin since the 1920s, and many famous and great writers, musicians and actors have lived here. News Ufa, formerly known as Anders Ufa, the other shore, opened on the 1st of April 1977 as the first openly gay bar in Germany, maybe even in Europe, and it's one of the oldest cafes in all of Berlin. Bowie and Iggy were regulars at the cafe for late breakfast of espresso and cigarettes and supper cocktails, whilst living next door at 155 Hofstrasse, where incidentally, Bowie painted his room electric blue. My friend Nils worked at Adler's Ufa not long after he first moved to Berlin in 1987. He witnessed the fall of the wall and many new customs from the east. They used to have art shows in the cafe sometimes and there was once a display of Tom of Finland's stylized homoerotic illustrations and still the old ladies who would sometimes come in for cake sat happily amongst the pictures. And they still do exceptionally good cake. Hansa Studios, located in Kothener Strasse in the Kreuzberg district, just round the corner from Postdamer Platz, are world famous. Many great artists have recorded here, and it remains a very special music house and creative centre today, standing right in the new old centre of the city. Back when the wall was still standing, just 200 metres away, it was more like being at the end of the world in the so-called no man's land. The master hall of the house, formerly Studio 2, where Barry recorded, was known as the studio by the wall. One of the windows in what is now the studio bar looks out to where the wall once stood. Bowie's song Heroes recorded at Hansa about two lovers defying the wall guards by kissing by the wall came from Bowie seeing two figures kissing from this window. It actually turned out to be the producer Tony Visconti who was having an illicit affair with one of the backing singers. Platz, U1. Bühlerstrasse, U2. Sophie Charlotte Platz, U2. Kurfürstenstrasse, U1. <coughs> Rathaus Schoenberg, U4. 
a man looking very hopperish at Nollendorf Platz, U4. Nollendorf Platz. Constanze Strasser, U7. Fail Berliner Platz, U3. Fail Berliner Platz, U7. Parada Strasser, U6. Hansa Platz, U9. Friedrich Strasser, S Bahn. Prenzlauer Ali, S Bahn. Platz der Luftbrücke, U3. Heidelberger Platz, U3. And Dahlendorf, U3. Oscar Schlemmer of the Bauhaus said, one should start with one's physical state, with the fact of one's own life, with standing and walking, for taking a step is a grave event. I want to take another step. When I first arrived in my new city, the New York Times declared, Berlin is so over. Well, thanks, I thought. But why should I take any notice of an American newspaper? Certainly Berlin has changed. Nothing much stays the same. But I know where I'd rather be. Prince Lauerberg or Peckham. Wunderschönes in Paris auf der Rue Madeleine. Schön ist es im Mai in Rom durch die Stadt zu gehen oder eine Sommernacht still beim Weinen hier. Doch ich häng, wenn ihr auch lacht, heut noch an Berlin. Ich hab noch einen Kopf. 